Got it. Hey, folks. Welcome to another episode of the Smooth Burrito. I'm Frank. And I'm Trevor. And we're talking with YouTuber voice here. For some reason, uh, 10 ways <laughs> you can take a shit without leaving your chair. If only, I guess. <laughs> well, first you got to get a sawzall and like cut a hole in the bottom of it. Right, right. Something like gotta, that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, we're we're back. It's uh, our first cast in a minute. Um, yeah, we're, it's been a while. But uh, yeah, we got uh, stuff to talk about. But I guess first things first. Uh, you been playing anything cool? Yeah, I've been playing so much stuff, Frank. Um, I guess I want to talk about the big two, the ones that released this week. Um, not the doing your business in a chair that we spoke about <laughs> earlier. The um, two releases that came out this week, Spider-Man 2 and Super Mario Wonder. Uh, great games. And I'm like totally hooked on both of them. I'll start with Spider-Man 2. So I think we spoke on this a couple times in our podcast and that how we feel about Sony's first party lineup, how they really go hard in these like games as movies type thing. We get the things like The Last of Us and Uncharted and God of War. Um and then the sequels, you know, build off that in uh in different ways, but they do still feel a little samey. You know what I mean? I, I mean, we could look yeah. back at, you know, Last of Us, Last of Us Two. Yeah, big switch up. Um, twist story wise, gameplay wise was different, but mainly built mechanically off of the groundwork that was laid by The Last of Us uh, Part One. Then you've got God of War and God of War Ragnarok. God of War was like revamped, big change. Every sense of the game felt different. God of War Ragnarok just built off that groundwork. Still a great game, but still just felt like more God of War. Um, I was worried that we were going to have that same situation here with Spider-Man 2, where Spider-Man, huge release, best Spider-Man game, like one of the best superhero games ever made, in my opinion, and just a ton of fun to play. Miles Morales kind of built off that it was like dlc that was a uh uh independent release kind of launched with the ps5 etc spider-man 2 in ways yes feels a little bit more of yes this is just more spider-man but it's amazing <laughs> for lack of a better term you know what i mean <laughs> it's like it's so good and i want to say the story is so um yeah i don't really want to spoil anything i don't want to get into like any story beats or anything because it's like it's actually really good uh but the open world and how it swaps between peter and miles how it incorporates different elements of the story to like the world building of the open world um is really well done is a huge graphical upgrade loading times non-existent it is just really fun to like traverse this world they've added brooklyn and queens uh, i went to coney island and it's almost beat for beat like even the rides that are like the way they're positioned and stuff are almost a perfect match for like the actual coney island it's crazy um the attention to detail is significant in spider-man 2 and i really appreciate what they did there I do think that uh, it it could have done a better job of implementing new uh, ways to do like side like new side content, new um, things to like find. Uh, I think the main focus of like upgrades for this was you know obviously story. Then you've got uh, traversal. Uh, and then some graphical upgrades. But I would have really liked some sort of um, 
new innovation and i think that's kind of where you run into the limitation of doing like these very story focused um games you know what i mean yeah where you kind of have to like be in the same world with the same characters but you have to build on it enough to make it worthy of a whole new game um and i think you do run into some limitations with that but Overall, really, really enjoying my time with Spider-Man 2. Absolutely loving it. Um, do want to move on to Super Mario Wonder, though. Have you played this yet? No, I haven't. Uh, I haven't even seen it yet. I have a video uh, that I need to watch of gameplay, but I don't really know much about it. Sure. So I haven't played near as much of Super Mario Wonder because I have been kind of uh, sucked into Spider-Man 2. Uh, primarily right now but i have been we made it past the first few worlds put a couple hours into it uh and it is really really incredible uh this is the best 2d mario game i've played probably since super mario world in my opinion Damn. um super mario world being my favorite mario like 2d mario game i prefer 3d mario games and i think the reason for that is because of the direction that 2D Mario's took with the new Super Mario Brothers series that I wasn't, I wasn't too fond really of. Fan of those. Yeah, I just don't. I think all around they were kind of lackluster. I I didn't like the soundtrack. Uh, I didn't like you know the level design. I wasn't a fan of the art style. I felt that uh, some of it was just too like not creative enough. Like not. When you think of Nintendo and like Mario and things like that, they they really come up with some creative, innovative stuff. And I just never felt like new Super Mario Bros. games really hit those highs for me. And for that reason, I was a little down on 2D Mario games. And I liked the Mario Maker games, but I'm just not a huge fan. Like, it's not like the Nintendo designed level, so it's completely different feel. Those are completely different games, and those, like, shouldn't even be considered, like, in the same realm as, yeah. you know, traditional 2D Mario Nintendo games. Yeah, I could see and, if they were, like, releasing level packs or something, like Nintendo was, but, like, you know, as far as I know, it's just you're downloading the levels of various crazy people <laughs> and uh, seeing what they did. Yeah. And sometimes that's pretty wild, pretty fucking crazy, dude. So, yeah, I, I was really excited to see what Nintendo was going to do here. I have consistently found in these various levels these interesting hidden things, secret areas. Um, and I'm, like, surprised at what it's doing quite often. You know, I'll be like, oh, wasn't expecting that. You know what I mean? There's a lot of that in Super Mario Wonder. And the art style is, it pops. You know what I mean? Like, it's really, it's, you know, it's colorful. It does a lot of really interesting things um, with some of the power-ups and, and kind of the way, like, levels turn on a dime. It, it's It's very creative, right? This is like, this is like the Nintendo that I wanted the creativity that I wanted from like a 2D Mario game, Super Mario Wonder is hitting those for me, at least in the first Good. few hours. Um, I'm having a lot of fun with the platforming. I will say it's a little bit on the easier side, although what I'm reading is later on in the game, you know, they have these uh, levels that are one to five star ranked and in terms of difficulty. And in the first few worlds, most of them are like one to two, maybe a couple three star levels. And they're all if you're familiar and good at platformers and Mario games, especially you're going to blow through these. They're very uh, easy. But from what I understand, the five star levels can get pretty difficult. So I'm looking forward to kind of hitting those. Uh, but from the most part, even with it being on the easier side, I'm having a ton of fun with it. It is a lot of fun, this game. And I'm really looking forward to, like, giving my full attention to it. Uh, definitely the best 2D Mario I've played in a very, very, very long time. 
Nice. Yeah, for a while it really did seem like 2D Mario games were kind of on life support. Like, the new Super Mario Brothers series, I don't have any of those games they released, like 76 or whatever. Like, Sounds right. <laughs> and yeah, it really many. just, like, it felt like they took pre-existing 3D models that they already had from, like, you know, I'm not going to say various sources because they all seem to have similar poly counts, like... But, you know, Nintendo probably has a suite of Mario models just at the ready because they use them so often. It seems like they really just took those, put them in like a 3D engine where they did up the 2D physics and then said, OK, good enough for those games, at least. So I'm glad to hear that this one like is uh, more, for lack of a better term, a flagship Mario game rather than just like, hey, we, we made a new Super Mario Brothers for you. Here you go. If that's your thing. Yeah, for sure. And then and then we had the new Super Mario Brothers Wii U, which of the new Super Mario Brothers games, that's probably the one I like the most, to be honest. Um, that one got ported to Switch, and I was like, they are really just riding this new Super Mario Brothers thing for so long. So when they announced Super Mario Brothers Wonder and took the new off of it and then showed off all of the, you know, different new things they were doing with it i i got really excited and rightfully so it's it's very good it's very good nice well i gotta talk about robocop rogue city i heard about this man i uh so i'm gonna i'm, I'm about to gush all over a fucking game real hard but uh they had that steam's next fest uh like i think last weekend or a couple weekends ago i don't know time's flat circle at this point in my brain but uh I pl they released a demo of that new RoboCop game that uh, was the first two areas, and it was very long. I, I played, I only got through the first area. I was going to play the second, but I didn't realize that, like, I'm, I'm stupid. I didn't realize the demo was, like, timed, and it was going to, like, you know, after the weekend, I couldn't access it. But uh, even just the first area of the demo, well, I got, like, almost three hours of gameplay out of it. Um, so they definitely gave you a big old, like, a shareware slice of the game, almost. Like, how they'd released, it, like, the first episode of Doom back in the day. Yeah. Um, which is good, because, like, I and I feel like the people at, uh, I think it's, like, Nacon who made this, I can't remember. But I feel like the people, like, at the, at the dev realize that if they released only the first part, which, like, any... Any, uh, I think, average company would see the first little chunk, like the intro mission of the game, as that's your demo, there you go. But I think the dev here realized that uh, that first chunk of the game is actually kind of boring, uh, which is good, because once you get past that, the game actually, like, the first chunk of the game, uh, the first mission, like the intro mission, is just straight-up shooter. You don't have access to, like, all of... Uh, or any of the, the like, abilities that uh, RoboCop will have later. Um, so you're just kind of walking through shooting. And, you know, you can do some funny stuff. Like, you get used to, like, the fact that RoboCop controls, like, a tank because he's RoboCop. You can throw people through windows. And, like, there's that, that there. But it really just serves as here's the combat. Um, and I think in, in the final game, what I would do with that is I would make it so that... Because there's a point where... At, towards the end of the mission, RoboCop gets shot in the face as the excuse for why you need to refill his stat block, essentially. So I'd make it like a like an Alucard or a Samus setup where, like, you have all of your abilities that you can mess with in that area until he gets shot in the face, just so you can get a taste of, like, what it's going to be at the end game. But anyway, after that, you get dropped into a police station... And, like, the police station from RoboCop. Like, it's it's very, very, very accurately done. Everything in this game is, like, a, a lovingly rendered as close to the movies as, like, they possibly could. But I also never felt the game was shoving references in my face, like a lot of things do. Also, Peter Weller's back as RoboCop, which uh, was just, I don't know, an automatic, like, you know, two points plus for me. Because Peter Weller's great, and there's a ton of them in this game. But it drops you in the police station, and the first thing the game has you do is, uh, you, like, you're, you're told walk down to the, uh, firing range so you can calibrate your, you know, your RoboCop, whatever. But this game, it's an RPG, uh, 
not completely like Deus Ex, there's not like a shitload of items or anything, but at least as far as dialogue goes, you're talking to people constantly. Like, um, yeah. I'd say the game is almost like if you took a shooter and duct taped it to a Phoenix Wright game, which I was not expecting, but when I'm in the police station, this guy asks, hey, RoboCop, can you open another line here? Because like, there's people at the police station making complaints and needing shit done. And he's like, RoboCop, can you open another line? It's uh, getting busy. And you actually go and open a fucking complaint window and then just take, like, three complaints. All of the dialogue in them is both very funny and very dark in a very RoboCop way. I enjoyed that. Um, and I'm like, okay, okay, I see what we're doing here. This game's more interesting than I thought it was going to be. And then I, I do my... Uh, my uh, you know, your, your shooting gallery stuff just to, like, I don't know, practice or what have you. Then the game sends you out uh, ostensibly to go do the first mission, which takes place in a very, very nicely rendered 80s arcade, all of RoboCop 2. Um, it looks great. But that area is pretty big. I don't know if you ever played, like, The Darkness um, or anything oh. like that. You, you know yeah, how that I game do. was, like, a series of, like, open world hubs kind of connected by the rail network yeah uh it's a similar thing here where the games at least it seems to be granted this is all based on the demo i don't know if they're going to change anything for the final game i really hope not but like it seems to be that like the game takes place in these open world hubs and like robocop can travel between them i don't know if you can only do that at like chapter end or if you are going to be able to go like throughout the whole city eventually to figure shit out but you're walking around, and I realized two things. One, I don't have access to my gun at all. Like, I can't, I can't take it out because I'm not under threat, and I'm RoboCop. He can't use his gun unless, like, someone's essentially pointing one at him or threatening him in some manner. Um, so then I, I, like, I realized, oh, this is going to be a lot more talking to people than I thought, which is great. That's what I was looking for. I wanted to do investigative shit as RoboCop. Uh, the second thing that struck me, and I really appreciated, is this is not a map full of shit game, like, you know, uh, a Far Cry or a uh, Bethesda game. You do not uh, load into, or like a latter-day Bethesda game, I should say, you don't load into an area and there's, like, a ton of, like, oh, you, you know, talk to this guy, here's a point, like, whatever. Like, there's no map points. You actually have to go around the area and discover things that are happening. Like, and then RoboCop will note them on the map, which I think does make sense in character. He's a robot, he can just do that. But, like, you have to go discover objectives and what's going on and then like if someone says hey go to that gas station we'll ping you to the gas station fine but like it's within a quest line and i think like the switching between quest lines is pretty well done like when you discover a new one it uh it doesn't do the annoying thing that like borderlands does or a few other games do where it automatically switches you to whatever like new quest you found and you have to go into the menu but you can hold a button while the new quest discovered thing is up and auto switch to it otherwise you just go into your objective list and switch like normal um and yeah the, the stuff that like i was finding to do i solved like uh i solved the murder of like a prostitute which involves like talking to a bunch of people at a commercial shoot I don't, I don't want to wreck, like, a ton of the plot here or anything, but all of the dialogue was really funny, entertaining. Um, I had to, like, you know, you have to look through the environment for clues. RoboCop has essentially detective vision. I think they call it RoboCop vision, but honestly, like, uh, I, I would say that, like, even though Batman Arkham did that first, it makes more sense that RoboCop would have that, because, you know, he had it in the fucking movies, but I digress. But you have to actually have to look around the environment and discover clues, and you can fail these missions. Um, and the game will track that under failed objectives, which I found was pretty great. It means that there's... Yeah. I'm not just going through dialogue trees, there's actual stakes here. And uh, what, what accomplishing these things does lead to is, like, you get a higher public trust score, which basically converts into experience points to up your stat tree, um, which RoboCop does have some very interesting... Uh, abilities that I'll get to, but like, 
so yeah, I'm going through, I'm, I'm looking for clues. There are like, uh, another side thing I had to do was like, I had to find a stolen car. And at that point I found out that, uh, the game will stat check you like, like an RPG. This is an RPG. You're play role playing as RoboCop. Like, uh, so if you have a high engineering skill, like I was able to realize that, Hey, these batteries on this table are charged like they've just been used, which means they've been yanked out of a car recently. Let me use this information to pressure the mechanic to give up his assistant who jacked the car. Um, like, but if I hadn't done that, there's enough other stuff in the environment to where it would have maybe taken me longer to uh, find evidence that I could then talk to that guy about, or I would have done it via a different mechanism, but like... You know, it's pretty freeform in the way you're able to approach it. It seems like, I don't want to use the phrase immersive sim, because it's not as complex as something like a Deus Ex or a KOTOR, like, but it's definitely, it feels more simmy than, like, a lot of games recently. Uh, there's tons of cool little environment details. They nailed how the lighting and everything looks perfectly, like... You get, you go into, like, Detroit, it's, like, this fucking the grungy city at night, there's a bunch of, like, uh, like, you know, neon signs and stuff, giving off really nice glows, everything looks good. You go into a convenience store, it has a bunch of funny, like, fake brands, some of which are original, some of which already exist in the RoboCop world, but everything looks cohesive, like, um... The only criticism I would have graphic-wise, and I, it is important to note at this juncture that, A, this game is $50. I already I already pre-ordered it. Uh, B, it was made by a very small team whose only, like, only previous stuff aside from a shitload of shovelware was that Terminator game that surprised everybody a while back. And uh, that Rambo game that everybody thought was rightfully so terrible. Like, that game was awful. But, uh... You can tell that, like, a lot of the character models are uh, reused and modified from other ones. Like, there's a, there's a doctor who uses the same model as, like, some of the women standing around and stuff. Like, and also the voice acting's a bit chonky. I don't know if that, like, I don't, aside from uh, Peter Weller, of course, I don't know if uh, it sounds like a lot of the stuff, like, a lot of the voice acting are the same people doing different voices. I don't know if that's, like, temporary stuff that's going to be changed out in between, like, now and when the game releases because they had, like, a month in between the two. Or if it's just, this is what you get because we're a small studio, this is what could we, we, we could afford. Either way, I'm fine. If the game, like, releases how it is, I am perfectly fucking happy, believe me. But, uh, yeah, there's also, like, it's not just, like, you know, let me find this objective, get the quest uh, marker and stuff. There's also just kind of, like... All kinds of little events that, uh, that, like, you come by that just provide, like, you know, color and realness to the area. Like, I walked by two bikers uh, talking about, what, like, oh, man, I had this date with this girl. And, like, she had, like, the biggest stalkers or whatever. Like, you know, just being really fucking crass. And then they both look at RoboCop and they're like, uh, move on, pig. This is a private conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I went, I went up. Like, I saw a ladder that I could climb um, to go up to the roof of a building, and I was like, let me go up here, see what's up here. The only thing up there, uh, no items, no no quests, no anything. The only thing up there was a guy who says to me, hey, you see that guy down there? He's a fucking asshole. And that was it. <laughs> Gotta love it, dude. It's... But yeah, that, uh, that, game, that game is already, already very fucking cool and uh it comes out next week i believe um and i'm definitely going to play the hell out of it i will have a more thorough report i suppose but uh, i've been enjoying the hell out of that that's awesome dude yeah it definitely seems interesting yeah it seems like uh it seems like a style of game that like hasn't really been pursued in a while because i, I feel like uh, oh shit. Uh, shut up. Sorry. I feel like, uh, co game companies are either go in the direction of making a full blown RPG, like a, uh, you know, like a Baldur's Gate 3 or something like that, 
or they go in kind of like the more lighter uh, Ubisoft's like open world map full of shit direction. Um, you don't really see anybody going down the middle much anymore, at least in my very off the cuff opinion. I'm sure there are counter examples to this, but like it's very refreshing to see um, a small team putting a lot of effort on like a, a game that is set up like this. It really, it really held my attention. Other than that, uh, I'm still playing F Zero X uh, on Project nice. Sixty Four Three. I I beat the Queen Cup on Standard yesterday, which uh, I had been, like, chiseling at for just, you know, playing here and there for, like, a month or so. And then I went and uh, I picked the King Cup just because I was like, I'm not going to win, but let me get familiar with the tracks. And then I beat that, too. <laughs> so I was like, awesome. <laughs> I didn't even have to fucking, like, like think about this. Uh, but, yeah, I don't know. I'd say that's what I've been up to. Nice. Nice. Um, and with that note, uh, I suppose it's time for news. I don't have a bump for that, so uh, let's just go into it. Um, news and reviews, I guess. We definitely have to talk about Armored Core 6 at some point. Yeah, we do. Um, I, don't, I don't have too much. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about was... You know, this PS5 Slim situation, which to me oh, is yeah. a complete and utter disaster. Um, it, number one, it's ugly. Uh, the PS5 itself is not the most appealing thing in the world, but it seems like they have managed to make it less appealing by putting a line down the middle of it and making half of it matte and half of, half of it glossy. Um, but in doing this slim release, they have managed to raise the price on it, which is completely um, opposite of what we're used to with a slim release years down the road after the uh, console was released. So the PS5 slim currently is $400. Um, the, or the PS5, like without the disk drive right like the digital yeah. only ps5 is 400 dollars. the ps5 slim without the disc drive and they're not calling it a slim they're calling it just the ps5 and then the ps5 uh digital edition or whatever so these are going to be just the ps5 from now on which is disappointing also but they have gone in and made the one without the disc drive 450 dollars now but by doing that to entice you to spend the extra $50 on it, they're going to allow you to add a disk drive to it later if you want to pay another $80 <laughs> for that disk drive. $80 fucking dollars for a disk drive. God damn. Making it a total of $530 for the same PS5 with a disk drive that is $500. Please exp make it make sense. Uh, it oh, just doesn't. I mean, they made, they made it uglier, so that's a bonus, I guess. And um, another thing to note, if you do buy it, with a, this just came out today, actually. Um, if you do buy the digital version and add the disk drive later, the first time that you add it, you will have to connect... It uh, it will need to verify it through the inter through an internet connection. <laughs> the disk drive. I this just, it just keeps getting worse, Frank. Hey, that's um, hilarious. I so Sony has in the past like done a thing with their Blu-ray licensing, which never like. I don't know how the relationship between Sony and the Blu-ray consortium works. I know that like Blu-ray is like a large percentage there, baby, like 80% at least. So I don't know if this is just essentially like robbing Peter to pay Paul, but like the, the, with the PS4, it wouldn't uh, play Blu-ray movies without first being connected to the internet at least once so that Sony could check the box that states, Hey, your PS4 has played a Blu-ray. We need to pay somebody. I wonder if this is a similar thing where even if you buy a disk drive, they don't want to, like, like just 
just in like they don't include the license with the drive at point of purchase because like that would involve for every drive they manufacture having to give money to the Blu-ray consortium for the licensing fee. Um, so their solution is you have to connect it to the internet at least once to, so that we can check that box so that you can actually use it as a disk drive, which is incredibly stupid for a thing that costs 80 fucking dollars. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I, I hate it. Um, just buy the disc based version, to be honest. Like if you're, yeah. I mean, I, I just don't, I do actually think that the best deal for an next gen console right now is the $400 PS five, uh, the digital one, right? I play most of my games digitally, but $400 for the next gen, like fully featured console, uh, is not a bad price. Um, the Xbox Series X is 500. The Series S is 300. If you want the new Series S with the bigger hard drive, I think it's the same size as the PS5 digital version. Uh, you have to pay 350. And it's the Series S, so it's significantly downgraded from the Series X and PS5. So for 50 more dollars, you could get the PS5 digital version. You know what I mean? It it, it just yeah. makes the most sense. Um, it, uh, I it never, just, I never, it, it's disappointing. Yeah, I never really thought of these digital only consoles as a good purchasing prospect in the long run. Um, because, and we, we, you know, we know this from just history bearing out these digital storefronts won't necessarily always be available for these consoles. So, personally, even even if you buy a lot of your games digitally, I think that if I'm buying a console, I want that disk drive just in case, like, there's games that I haven't played after end of life that I want to check out. Uh, of course, borrowing games from people uh, is way easier if you have an actual physical disk, like, uh, you know, like that old Sony uh, gag ad that they did, how to share games on PS4 when Microsoft... Uh, announced like that the uh, the expo was going to be online only and everyone flipped a tizzy uh yeah. a rightful tizzy um but a tizzy nonetheless uh but yeah like i don't i don't think a digital only console is a really good purchase for any sort of like expected longevity out of these things that do cost like you know like like you said 400 bucks on the low end here at least um yeah. so and also having a disk drive will ensure the availability of the media probably beyond the digital store. But anyway, yep. Uh, I, I also think that like, it's, it's really, really fucked up to go. What three console generate four console generations. The PlayStation one had one as well Four console generations where your new refresh is a model that is uh cheaper um, and easier on the wallet for the consumer in exchange for like, you know, more manufacturing efficiency that makes it easy to produce. They understand more about the architecture so they know where they can, uh, for lack of a better term, cut corners. But flipping that script seems really dickish and completely in line with the overall attitude of uh, large gaming companies lately where they are one of the only sectors that can't, like, greedflation their prices higher and they're pissed off about it. Like, yeah. we have just made $70 games the norm, which I find completely egregious. Um, and there are still CEOs grousing about that, saying game prices need to be higher. So, I don't know. I, I think I think it's just not, it's not a good move. Uh and I know the play here is just they're going to let like existing stock of the other PS5 wind down to the point where these slims are the only thing on the market. But yep. yeah, it's just kind of gross all around. That's the only bit of news I had, though. Um, I think we need to talk about Armored Core 6 before we jump off for sure. Yeah, I did have a, a one small. Well, not, it's not really a small oh. bit of news, so. Microsoft bought Activision. How do you feel about that? Because yeah. I don't feel good. Well, 
we talked about it before because it's been going on forever. This finally went through. I never felt good about it. I don't like how I don't like the whole trend of like, let's buy this company. Let's buy this company. Um, and it just has it like those company, those acquisitions just haven't produced at the highest level for Microsoft yet. You know, I mean, at some point they will, I'm sure. Um, I don't like the purchase of Activision. Activision was already too big, right? Yeah. This is not a, this is, I mean, Bethesda was pretty, pretty fucking big, but this is like next level. It'd be like, this is a huge, huge, huge acquisition. Um, it's significant. Do I like it? Not really. But I think we can't really say much about it until we see how it affects um, exclusivity and, you know, what they actually build and produce for Microsoft, et cetera. Uh, it's hard to say the route that it goes down. But, um, yeah. yeah, no, I'm not a fan yeah, I do. I do need to point out uh, for anybody listening. Um, if you think that this is a good thing based on the fact that all of this Activision, Blizzard, Bethesda, like all this shit is going to be available in Game Pass now, uh, their goal is to use Game Pass as a loss leader. And they've said this in internal and external business communications. Yeah. Their goal is to use Game Pass as a loss leader, get you suckered in and then jack the price up like every other subscription service. So don't don't bet on that last thing long term like there are they have and they really recently released they have growth targets for ceo compensation i'm sure they'll hit those and then like immediately flip the switch to okay now it's 20 dollars a month now it's 30 dollars a month but it's such a great value you see because you get access to all these games um and yeah like call, call me a cynic or what have you but yeah these these companies consolidating, especially Microsoft. Like, I see people online who obviously aren't aware of how Microsoft operates in the software business being like, yeah, this is really awesome, having everybody under one roof. Uh, no, their whole, their motto used to be, and granted this was only towards open source software, or and their competitors actually in general, but like, embrace, extend, extinguish, as in, embrace open source software, extend its capabilities with proprietary shit, and then kill off the open source software outright by having the more preferred thing in the market. Uh, and you, know, you don't you don't want a company with this attitude being large enough to put their thumb on the scale regarding anything consumer facing, essentially. Right. But... I don't know. With, with that note, it's time to stop talking about uh, re real evil companies and time to start talking about fictional evil companies because we got to talk about Armored Core 6. I'm going to let you lead this one uh, I because... Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Okay, I'll I'll start off with it. I didn't make it very far, Frank. Um, I know you're a huge Armored Core fan. I was, I'm was. i a much more casual Armored Core person. Have I played some Armored Core games in the past? Yes, I have. Um, I do always remember them being very difficult. Uh, I am a fan of the mechs and the customization and just the overall intricacies of the combat and things like that. It's fun. They're fun games. This one is no different in a sense. Um, it's too difficult for me and you know like i like from software games i like souls games i've finished demon souls dark souls uh you know elden ring i've put tons of hours into that so you know bloodborne i've finished multiple times that's probably my favorite from software game but um this one i think just required too much stick skills for me um and it's not saying that that's particularly a bad thing i could have got there had i put the extra time in uh but i it the difficulty spikes were too frustrating for me to want to put the extra time in if that makes sense uh, i felt like Sometimes the difficulty was like perfect. You know, you get that extreme gratification from trying over and over again to beat a boss and it just hits and it does that typical from software thing where it like 
you know, triggers that rewarding feeling and you want to keep going. Right. And then there were times where you'd hit a wall and you just, you don't, eventually I just didn't feel motivated to play anymore. Uh, and that's again, not to the detriment of the game or its design. I understand that that's kind of what it's designed to do. And there are some very hardcore armor core fans that prefer it that way. And this is a good armored core game. It's just not for me. Uh, uh, why, 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 why don't you get good though? Why, why don't you get good at the video game though? Isn't that the fa- nah, nah, and I'll say. In all seriousness, I understand, and I can swing in with the, with the design criticisms now because, like you said, I am I am intimately familiar with this uh, series, um, and I do think that it is a very very difficult game. It's also the easiest armored core game uh, in terms of quality of life stuff, and I I feel like what we're experiencing here with with this game is and and granted i don't have any actual internal insight into how the development of this game went i'm just going based off of a feeling but it feels like to me that there were two sides debating here there was one side that was old guard armored core who wanted a game like the older games especially like the ps2 era ones where you get one shot at the mission. If you fail it, it might even drop off your board of available missions. You're going to get charged for fucking up that old style shit. And then there was a, a new Vanguard who wanted uh, this game should be more forgiving because the thing about Souls games is that even though they are difficult moment to moment, they are very forgiving in terms of actually wasting your time, which I will expound upon in a second. But... I feel like there there were people in the room who wanted a more um, user friendly quality, like like uh, modern quality of life uh, oriented video game, and we ended up with this weird half measure, like how, for example, the game the game checkpoints. So if you die, it will like you can go just right back into the mission, no penalty at all. Uh, into the checkpoint, you're allowed to modify your loadout of your mech with, like, the parts that you happen to have in your stock before the checkpoint, or before you go back in, it'll refill all of your, like, uh, well, for lack of a better term, it'll refill all of your Estus flasks, because that's never really been in Armored Core either. Uh, that was totally something they just pulled in from Dark Souls. Uh, as was, like, the overall poise system, I think, or at least that how, um obvious it is that the poise system comes from Sekiro in that game, which I'm not criticizing. I think it's a very good addition, uh, being able to stagger opponents. But, uh, anyway, like it does, it will checkpoint. You can change your loadout. The older games never let you do that. It would just like, you know, you failed the mission, either retry or you don't have it available. Um, but it doesn't let you go back into the menu, uh, to like, you know, buy parts that you might be missing, which did fuck me on the boss that you got stuck on. Um, but, like, and that seems just very odd to me. Why can I do everything to my mech aside from go to the shop? And why does this game checkpoint so hard and give me just, like, a restart point, essentially, but I can't even do, like, the Fire Emblem suspend save thing? I suppose you, if you're playing it on console, you could rely on the ability to suspend the game from the console, right? But, uh... PC players, I guess you just have to keep that shit running the whole time if you don't want to have to uh, redo the entire level beforehand. And, like, the Balteus level, because that's, you know, that's that's the boss uh, in question here. It's this big environment uh, at the start where if you aren't able to analyze it and understand, like, the approach here and what they want you to do immediately, that can just, like, tear your entire, like, uh, mech completely fucking apart. Then once that's done, you have to face another AC. Uh, then once that's done, you still have to fight the boss. And that, is, granted, it checkpoints in between all of those, but that's a lot of shit for you to need to re-go through just because you don't have the pulse rifle, or, or the pulse uh, gun in question, that you need. Um, yeah. 
The other thing about Balteus is that it's an example of the game. The, the game is about flexibility in your build choices and fucking around with, like, your build in different ways until it's not, and it has a thing that it wants you to do exactly, and, like, the boss, like, the, the AC before Balteus is a hint as to how they think your AC should be configured. He has the pulse gun in one hand to take down the shield. He has the blade in the other hand to, uh, you know, do the stabby stabby. Um, but it's still railroading you into a build that you might not necessarily have. In my opinion, I would just make it so that if you checkpoint, um, you can just go back to the menu and, like, fuck around with shit. Like, I don't see, I don't see any compelling reason not to have that. And if you do not want to have that, I feel like at this point, even though FromSoft is incredibly against it and always has been, difficulty settings. Uh, and I'm not yeah. saying, like, you need to change enemy behaviors or rework any AI or the actual annoying stuff that comes with having difficulty settings, but just, like, you know how in Forza there are a ton of driver assists that you can toggle on or off and, like... It'll result in you getting more money, essentially. You could go that route. You could have it so that, like, okay, you know, th like, if you toggle this stuff off, like, uh, you don't have access to New Game Plus until you, like, you know, go beat it properly after, like, whatever. Or, like, just have it, like, easy mode is this, hard mode is this. Um, I, fe I feel like that would have gone a long way here because the game is still aggressively unfriendly to new players. To the point where, take that Balteus fight, like, uh, small spoiler, you are given a new voice in your ear during that fight. Um, I'm not going to expound upon who they are, but uh, you're given a new voice in your ear that says, I will help you to fight this thing. And then she proceeds to say absolutely nothing, except when you lose, she says, I'm sorry. That's it. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, maybe she could be like, hey. Uh, yeah, he seems to have a big old shield. Maybe you should buy, like, the fucking particle gun. And also, like, like the thing the thing about, uh, like, how how projectiles work in this game and how Baltasis projectiles work specifically is that, like, the game wants you to overboost in on him because the missiles will either miss or do way less damage. Your shots will do more damage. And, like, you're just supposed to be ducking in and out at least until the second phase of that boss where the key is... And and the second phase of that boss is just the shit, like, moves that seem like they insta-kill you, because if you get caught by them, they do. And the key there is to just stay in the air, but the game doesn't indicate that at all either, really, aside from just, like, you have to analyze what the boss is doing in an unfamiliar pattern that is such that you might not even, like, uh, be aware that this is another phase where he's going to have different moves, and he's hard to track on your radar, too, sometimes. You might not even be looking for him before he, like, grapples you and makes you explode. Yeah. And then, like, you, you take that and you add on the fact that, like, you face that boss, and then the game afterward throws another boss at you, the street sweeper thing, which, granted, is pretty easy. I have seen people refer to that boss as a boss that's supposed to make you feel powerful and smart after you have beaten the actual hard one. Um... You beat him, and then there's another boss right after that, like this giant spider thing. And I'm like, and 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 unlike uh, an Elden Ring or uh, a Dark Souls, you can't just walk away from that. Like, sure, you have like if there are any training missions left, you could do those. There are arena fights you can do, but that's all side stuff. That's pretty quick. There aren't any missions proper, and the game. It's not like the game doesn't have that. It's not completely linear. It just like it decides to be linear for three levels in a row in a way that I don't really get. And people have called that, oh, that's the that's the streamer filter or whatever. That's the get good filter, right? But I don't... I think, it, A, it comes way too early to the point where you might not even have your proper bearings on how this game is played. Uh, B, like, why do that? Why, why, why have a, a, a just a giant fucking skill spike like right after the first part of your game. It doesn't make much sense to me. I feel like it should be later if you're going to do that. Um, and yeah, the, afterwards the game opens back up again and you are, you have your choice of missions that you can do. There are easier ones. There are hard ones. 
and you can like you know play the game in a bit more of an open fashion you have options if you fail at something but for that stretch where you where you fell off it does not give you any of that and i don't get it yeah i agree with literally everything you said to be honest like i still really like the game and i think I also go in with uh, these games and with FromSoft stuff in general with the mindset that, like, I'm going to play this at my own pace and in my own time. So I actually, I'm only, like, probably about halfway through my first run of Armored Core 6. Um, I need to pick it back up, but I might pick up my Elden Ring save for a bit first because I tend, I tend to switch off between yeah. games and I don't, like, beat everything in one sitting or multiple sittings in a row but uh you know adhd brain or whatever the hell but yeah. like i feel like that important that approach is very important to the point where the game might want to tell you that if this is the route it's gonna go like in one of those fucking inane tips it gives you which really just amount to don't explode like i haven't seen something uh on those load tips that like was useful to me at all even even yeah. like taking the standpoint of someone who hasn't played this franchise. I agree. I would agree. Yeah, and might as well say shoot the cyber demon until it dies. <laughs> yeah, right. But yeah, I don't know. It's still it's still a good game. I, I'm pre I'm certain it's gonna get a sequel. Like it's the it's definitely the highest selling armored core game, and it's while it didn't meet Elden Ring levels, it's still selling like hotcakes covered in hotcake sauce, so yeah, uh, for ho sure. Hopefully, a sequel does iron out so, so, or even just like an expansion pack does iron out some of these problems. Um, or just like they could, you know, a patch could even do this if they should decide to do that. I don't think they're going to, but yeah. I think it's a good th game, and I think it's entirely understandable why you bounced off of it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I don't have time, like. I don't have time to spend with games that it, like I feel um, that I'm just not like aren't worth my time to get good at. Right. Like it, I would have had to the get for me to spend the time to get really, really good at it. Um, it would have had to been like the most amazing thing I played. You know what I mean? And it just um, while it's really good, it's just not that. Yeah. Uh it's yeah yeah it's just it's it's hard it's hard to sm smash your face into a wall repeatedly it's like when you do get stuck on a boss or an area in a from so like well in a from soft game they're all from soft games i'm doing the thing that i hate it when people do it when i like where people pretend that from soft's first game ever was demon souls um yeah but like it's like their souls games where you like are stuck on an area and you, you like and and a lot of a lot of that, that like, uh, at that point, you aren't making the choice to go do something else, but, like, here you're just stuck slamming your face against that wall. My run with Balteus was about uh, three hours of just me trying to beat the fucking boss, and first, I understood that my build was wrong, but I was seeing if I could just brute force my way through it for, like, an hour and a half. Couldn't dumped out to the menu, got the, uh, the, the, the plasma, uh, pistol, got what I thought I needed, went back in, realized, oh no, I bought this shit for the wrong hand, so, like, my, my configuration, because I was totally just, like, uh, save scumming the checkpoint, essentially, and, like, beating the guy before, before Balteus, uh, with my setup how I liked it, Smashing my face into Balteus immediately so he'd kill me, and then, like, reloading at the checkpoint so all my health bips would be refilled and, like, I could reconfigure. Realizing I bought the gun for the wrong hand so I don't have access to the, uh, offhand weapons I need. And then trying with that setup, still failing, and then finally just saying, fuck it, I'll do the whole mission over again, I go back out, I get what I need, and, like, yada yada yada, I finally beat him. Um... So yeah, I don't know. It's definitely like it is definitely a frustrating endeavor sometimes, but also there are missions in that game that hit my brain in a way that I haven't uh had occur since Metal Warriors on Super Nintendo. 
in terms of just making me feel like I'm in a fucking robot, an like a mech anime or what have you. Like, I'm thinking specifically of the one where the uh, the planetary authority or whatever first shows up, which you you haven't gotten to yet. But like, um, it's a bunch it's a bunch of ships just dropping units in, and it's this little this it's this area that you like. That whole mission, you are facing down the same guys that you have been fighting, and it's it's very easy. You get to steamroll through a bunch of shit, and then at the end, it's like, oh no, here come the big boys, and they kill all of the guys that you've been killing, and then it's this little enclosed area where you have to figure out, like, I need to... What I did was I went up on top of the building, shot the guys who were sniping me from the rooftops, and then just hung out there while the... Uh, the one AC that spawns, like, would pop up, I would shoot him a few times, he would drop back down because he didn't have enough boost, rinse, repeat until he died, and then I cleaned up the area. Um, and that, like, at the end of that, you're jumping between, like, like, like space warships trying to, like, stab the fucking bridge, uh, which I thought was really cool. So, that, like, there's stuff in that game that I love. Um, but, uh, yeah, I guess I, I completely understand your reaction to it, and, uh, I, I hope it I hope someday you're able to make a run another run at it. Yeah, I might go back to it whenever I don't have other stuff going on. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. We're we're at about an hour here. Did you have anything else you wanted to cover? No, man, that covers it. All right. Well, I think that's gonna do it for us. Um do we have actually, do we have a game in the pipe for like uh, the game, the, I guess like gaming book club or whatever? The thing that if there are people who actually listen to this now that your YouTube channel is uh, getting views, they can participate in too. What, what was our next thing going to be? And it can't be my pick because no my pick was going to be Armored Core 3 and that's not going to work. Uh, sh I, have, I have no clue. Um, hmm. I haven't given it a thought. Do you have anything? Any ideas? Uh, um, I don't. I don't have anything immediately in my brain's pipe, but I do know that you have access to that uh, Nintendo thing on Switch. So I do. I'm gonna say uh, play F Zero X because I know I'm okay, gonna do that do between now and the next time we record. So, all right, F Zero X, it is. Yeah, and we will uh, catch you later. All right, bye everyone.